In this four part video series, I'm gonna go over in detail my top four methods of catching winter steelhead. This is part one, floats and jigs. If you're new here, my name is Barry Rager. Welcome to my channel, Rage Fishing. On this channel, I cover all types of fishing throughout the state of Oregon, but there's no species I'd rather be chasing than winter steelhead. So in this four part series, I'm gonna cover floats and jigs, floats and beads, drift fishing, and hardware, which is spinners and spoons. For each one of these methods, I'm gonna go over the why and the when to fish each method. I'm gonna go over the gear you need, rods, reels, line, and tackle. We'll talk about the rigging. We'll go over the technique, like how to fish each one. And along the way, I'm gonna give you some bonus tips as well. So let's start with part one, floats and jigs. So we'll start with the why and the when. First of all, when people come to me and they say they want to start steelhead fishing but they don't know what technique to start with, I always suggest floats and jigs just because it's a simple setup and a simple technique. Secondly, for me, when I start fishing a run, I always start with a float and jig. I think it's the least intrusive. Therefore, if the fish doesn't want a float and jig, I might be able to follow up with a bead, drift fishing, or spinner or spoon. So now let's talk about the wind. Now all four of these techniques can be fished under a variety of different water conditions, but each one has their specialty. For me, floats and jigs really shine when the water is low and clear. In fact, on real low and clear water days, you'll see me fishing with a little float like this AF1 from Hawken and an eighth ounce jig. When the water is a little bit bigger, maybe it's more of a medium height, I'll up my bobber size to an AF7. These ride just a little bit better in bigger water. But where you're gonna have a little bit of struggles with floats is when the water is high. Now you can still pick up some fish along the water's edge where there's less turbulence. I certainly have. In fact, I have a video on my channel. It's called High Water Steelhead and you'll see me fishing the edges and still getting a few bites with jigs. So now let's talk about gear starting with rods. I like a nine and a half to 10 and a half foot spinning rod because you gotta be able to control that line and float. And you need to be able to mend your line so you're not getting a big belly of line on the water, which will pull your float down river unnaturally. And if you don't have a natural float, you're just not gonna get any bites. So I like a moderate action rod because it flexes all the way into the middle and that acts as a huge shock absorber for those running steelhead. I like a medium light to medium power rod because if I'm fishing light baits, light floats like these ones here, the lighter rod loads a little bit better and you can cast this lighter stuff longer distances. Now the reason I like spinning reels is because when you're trying to extend your float, you open up that bail and there's very little resistance to that line coming off the spool so it doesn't interfere with your float and jig. So moving on to line. Now if you're a beginner, what I would recommend is just stick with monofilament. I would recommend Trilene XL by Berkley. This is 10 pound test in the clear. The reason being is because it's very manageable on a spinning reel and there's very few working parts. You have your line, rod reel, a float and a jig and you're fishing. Most of my friends and family that I have start jig fishing, this is how I set them up. So if you're a more experienced angler and wanna use braid, I recommend Power Pro Super Slick. This is the V2 30 pound test. This is the high vis just so you can see it a lot better. This is awesome line. I've been using it for a number of years. The thing about braid though is you're going to have to tie a splice knot to a leader material. I like 10 pound Maxima Ultra Green. Generally when I'm stepping up to using my rod with braid, I'm fishing bigger water and visibility isn't a problem. When you're fishing braid, it's a little harder to fish these super lightweight floats. It needs just a little bit more weight to pull the line off the spool easier. So I would recommend at that point to go with an AF7 or if you want to use a slip float like an AF5 or 6. So if you do want to fish braid even in low and clear conditions and you're using like an AF7, what you can do is tie like a number 10 barrel swivel to your ultra green and put let's say two feet of fluorocarbon just so the fish can't see it quite as easily. So now let's go over floats in just a little bit more detail. Now, if the water's low and clear, you're gonna want a small fixed float. So what I would recommend is an AF1, like this one made by Hawken. This is a quarter ounce, but they also have an eighth ounce. And this is an AF2, which is another small, very low profile float. And this is an eighth ounce, and I believe they have it in quarter ounce as well. Now, if you're fishing braid, or if you're fishing a little bit bigger water, I would recommend bumping up to the AF7. This is a very versatile float. Plus it's really easy 
easy to see. I've started using this in a lot of the videos just because it's easier for you to see it on video when it goes down. But this one here, it has two weights on the bottom so that you can fish it with eight and quarter ounce jigs. It's a fixed float as well. It's got rubber tubing top and bottom that holds your line to the float. There's a hole through the body of the float which helps keep those floats when you get snagged on the bottom. So if you break off, it helps in retention. The third float I will talk about is a slip float. This is an AF6, but they also make an AF5. These come in eighth ounce, quarter ounce, and the AF5 comes in three eighths half ounce and five eighths. Where these might come in handy is if you have a really deep run on your river and you need to get that jig down, let's say eight or 10 feet. Well, it's really hard to cast a fixed float if you have eight feet of line between your jig and your float at times. Whereas with the slip float, you can position your bobber stop at whatever depth you're fishing. When you cast in, this, this slides up the line to the bobber stop. So what I'll actually do is not only would I put a bobber stop and bead above the float, but I'll also put a bead and a rubber bobber stop below the float so that if I am fishing a lower section of water, I can fix the float by just basically pulling the bobber stops top and bottom. So now it's time to talk about jigs. Now, if you've been following my channel for any amount of time, you know I love a nightmare jig. In fact, most of the time I'll have this jig tied on. It's a Hawken number 63. It's the eighth ounce Hackle Series Nightmare Jig. This thing is deadly. I don't know what steelhead think it is. It's got a white head, red body, and black tail. But I have more hookups on this than any other jig pattern. Probably a second to that would be the 135, which is the Marabou series of the Nightmare Jig. Sometimes when the water's just a little bit bigger, it offers just a little bit more of a profile. Some other colors to consider. This is a number 11 in the Rabbit Hair series. It's red, it's got a red bead and a white head. Another one I always have in my box, this is a 103. This is a Marabou. It's black with a little bit of red on it. They make this in a hackle. It's all, it's the 43. A couple other colors just real quick to show you. This is a 65. It's got a white head. It's got peach and pink. And then lastly, as far as the hackle series, I like the 31. It's got a white head. It's got a little bit of pink to it and a pink and white tail. I don't have one with the cardboard, but that's kind of what it looks like right there. Now I can't talk about jigs without talking about jig heads with a rubber worm. So Hawken makes three packs in their jig heads. I like white. I think it's a really good contrast and I've had good luck with it. And I use it with either a bubblegum pink rubber worm like this by WFO, or I've got some Mad River pink haze. In fact, Steelhead Adventures part one, I hooked a fish with one of these to three inch with a white jig head. Where worms really shine is when it's really rainy, the rivers are starting to rise, so the earthworms start getting washed into the river, and hey, steelhead are just big rainbow trout, and so they love these things. I was kind of a holdout for worms, didn't really have a lot of luck with them, and one day my river was rising, and right at the end of the day, I'm like, you know what, I better throw on a worm and just try it, and I ended up hooking four steelhead in two hours. So I often get asked if I use bait or scent when I'm jig fishing, and the answer is no. In fact, every steelhead that you can see caught on this channel is without using either. If you feel more confident fishing with bait or scent, go ahead. I just think it's unnecessary. I should note that in Oregon, soft plastics like rubber worms and soft beads are considered bait. I know that doesn't make a lot of sense, but I just wanna make sure that you understand that if your river says artificial flies and lures only, those are illegal. I just wanna make sure everybody knows that. So I've got three of my rods already rigged up with these three different float systems that we've been talking about. So I'll go ahead and start showing you those. In low clear water, this is the rod that I really like to use. It's a G Loomis IMX. It's an 1163. It's a medium light, moderate fast action. I have it paired up with an old Shimano Stratic CI4. The Vanford took the place of this reel. This is a 3000. When I'm fishing this rod setup, I'm using eight pound, Triline XL as a mainline. I have it rigged up with an eighth ounce, one of the AF1s, and I've got a 63 Nightmare Jig on there. So again, very simple method. I've got line, float, and jig, 
that's all you need. So next, this is a new rod to me. It kind of is taking the place of kind of like my medium height water rod. This is a striker. It's a local company made here in Eugene, Oregon. This is the 9.9. It's a medium power, moderate action. Pretty lightweight rod. It's got really good components. I've got it paired up with a Vanford 3000. It's a Shimano. I've got 30 pound super slick in blue on here. I've got it rigged up with ultra green as a leader material and an AF7 float. And I have it directly to a number 63 Nightmare jig. Again, I always start out with that jig right there. So the third rod here is an old G Loomis float rod. This is a 10 foot six. It's a medium light, moderate action. It's paired up with a Shimano Stratic 3000. It's an older model. I've got 30 pound super slick on here braid. I have a sliding float. This is an AF6 in the quarter ounce. As I mentioned, I have a rubber bobber stop below the float, a bead, and I have Dacron above with a second bead. I actually put two pieces of Dacron. It just gives you a little bit more resistance and that way if one of them comes off, you still have one. As I mentioned, I can peg this float to where it's a fixed float just like by doing that. Or if I'm fish fishing a deeper run, I can move that Dacron up and I can fish it pretty deep. I have it set up with a quarter ounce jig head and that's a pink haze three inch worm. Where I like a 10 and a half foot rod is when I have a really open river and I don't have a bunch of overhanging trees. Mending line is really important. So a 10 and a half foot rod really allows you to, to get that rod tip up in the air to keep that belly off the water. But this has caught quite a few steelhead for me. So now I'm just gonna show you how you affix an AF7 to the line, just really quick. I have some high-vis yellow line. I would never use this for float fishing, but I just wanna demonstrate how this works. So these AF7s have these little tubes. They're little rubber tubes. You put that on your line first, slip that on. Now they have these brass weights. Just so you know, those fall off very easy. The only thing holding them on is that rubber tubing. So take your line, put it through the hole in that float. Hang on to that. Take that orange tube and put it on your top post. Okay, so that's on there. Now, let's say I'm gonna be fishing an eighth ounce jig, so I'm gonna put both of these brass weights on this bottom post. Take my black tubing, put that on next. And there you have it, that's how it's affixed to the line. So to adjust that, you just need to pull on the bobber up or down. That way you can set your depths. Now always tie your jig on your line with a trialing knot. I'm gonna tie a jig on just to demonstrate how you need to fish this. A trialing knot has two loops through the eye. So put it through, make a loop. So it kind of looks like that. That's important because the two loops through the eye just make the knot that much stronger and it also holds the knot in place on that eye. You don't want it swiveling back and forth. So make sure that's all laying down flat. Five wraps. One, five. Through both loops. Now always wet your knots because if you tighten a knot when it's dry it's going to create friction and heat and that could potentially weaken your line. So wet your knot. Pull that all together. If you ever have a knot that doesn't lay down just perfectly, cut it off and start over because you don't want to lose a steelhead for a bad knot. All right, so the reason I have this all set up is I kind of want to demonstrate how you need to fish this, how it needs to look in the water. You want to set your bobber height so that the jig is right at the steelhead's level or maybe slightly above. Steelhead sit on the bottom of the river, so let's say you're fishing a run that's three to four feet deep. So set it, let's say, for three feet to start out with. So you pull that out to three feet, Obviously that's not three feet, it's about a foot, but I just wanna demonstrate how you need to fish this. If you can't really see the bottom of the river and you think that you might need to lengthen that, go ahead and lengthen it until you start to noticing it grabbing the bottom and then just shorten it up just a little bit. So when you cast that into the holding water, you want this bobber to be perfectly perpendicular. Even the top can be slightly pointing upstream like this. And what that's telling you is that your jig is pointing down river. The head of the jig should be pointing up river. That way if a steelhead comes up and grabs that jig, it gets them right in the snout. If you do have a bobber down, you wanna just sweep your rod up river, tighten your line, and these gamakatsu hooks usually will bury right in. You don't really have to do a secondary hook set. You just wanna keep tension on that rod so that it keeps that fish pinned. Now, if you start seeing 
seeing your float tip over, that means that your jig's hitting the bottom and you need to shorten that up. It could also mean that you're getting a little bit of a belly in your line and you need to mend to get that floating like this. So one more quick tip, you wanna cock the jig. And what that means is you take your knot and you kind of pull it slightly forward on the eye of that hook. And what that does is it allows that jig in the water column to be fishing parallel with the bottom of the river. You might have to reset that every few times you cast out because as you reel in, it'll kind of pull it back. But that way the jig is more floating in the river like that. To be successful with float and jig fishing, line management is the name of the game. So I'm gonna grab one of my rods just to kind of demonstrate a couple things. So I generally hold my rod between, with my reel seat in between my pinky and my ring finger like this. Now the reason that is, is I can use my index finger to touch the spool of my line, the lip of that. And the reason that's important, I'm gonna pull a little bit of line out here to kind of demonstrate. So if you're allowing your float to go downstream uninterrupted and that line is coming off of your spool, you can use your index finger to stop it. If you wanna keep extending your drift and your line's kind of sticking a little bit, you can kind of sweep your rod back and forth and that'll kind of peel that line off that spool. But anytime you wanna stop it, you can just put your finger down. So now let's talk about drag. I'm gonna use my Stratic to kind of demonstrate. You want your drag set tight enough so that if you have a bobber down and you sweep your rod, it's not so loose that it won't set that hook. So you want it to be able to be pulled out just a little bit like that. You don't want it too loose or too tight. If you hook a steelhead, what I will tell you is generally at the first 30 seconds is a madhouse. So you might want to loosen up this drag. Remember to turn it counterclockwise. I've made this mistake. I don't know what happens. You kind of lose your head when you hook a big fish. And if you turn it right, so clockwise, it's going to tighten it and you're probably going to break that fish off. So turn it left slightly so that that line peels off there just a little bit easier. As you tire out the fish, you can start turning it clockwise and tightening up that drag a little bit till that fish is worn out and you can land it. Another tip is don't forget that there could be fish right at your feet. There's an old joke that when you're on the bank, you cast towards the middle, and when you're in a boat, you cast towards the bank. Well, when you're bank fishing, don't forget there could be steelhead right in front of you. So start close and start working your way across that holding water. So as a bonus, my friend and number one fan, Richard T, has created three CAD diagrams of these three riggings. I'm gonna post those on my Facebook page at Rage Fishing and on Instagram at Stillhead Rage. So you can go there, save those photos to your phone so you can see these riggings and have them with you on the river. If I post them on this video and you try to screenshot it, it's just not gonna show the detail. So I'm gonna ask one thing. If you use these techniques, you're gonna catch steelhead. So if you catch a wild fish, and that's a fish with an adipose fin, take care of them, leave them in the water. If you've gotta get a picture, only do it if you have a buddy that's there with the camera. Keep them in the water. When the camera's ready, pick it up, click, click, get it back in the water and get it swimming. To ensure that we have these fish to go after for years to come, we need to take care of our wild fish. If you wanna see this technique further in action, I'm gonna put a video recommendation at the end just so you can see how effective floats and jigs can be for winter steelhead. Thanks for watching and we'll see you on part two, floats and beads.